I'm going to ask Le- uh, Earl to come up at this time and um, <clears throat> tell us his story. So uh, this is his name is Earl, and he's from uh, Redondo Beach, California. And I'd like to uh, everybody give a warm round of applause and a Cajun welcome to Earl. Jeez. Hi, everybody. My name is Earl. I'm an alcoholic. Hi. Um, I want to thank the committee for asking me to come and share. Um, all the people that I've talked to over the last few months on the phone, I've talked to a lot of people. Evan, Yogi, Pascal few others, I think. Um, and I particularly want to thank uh, Pascal for driving me around. We, he picked me up at the airport, brought me back here. We got up this morning and drove into uh, New Orleans to the French Quarter. Had a blast. Um, have you all seen that car he has? Has he told you about his car? Well, he is no longer known as Pascal. He is known as the Roadmaster. <laughs> He was flying, man. <laughs> oh. So, I drank. Um, and it wasn't a big deal. I mean, the only reason I drank is because uh, I, was, I, I started kind of late. I didn't start drinking until I was 12. And this guy, uh, this guy came up to me and said, I've been shipped off to boarding school. My... Uh, my father, uh, they did a bunch of tests on me. I was sleepwalking and talking in my sleep and scaring my parents and bothering everybody. So they took me to a doctor and had a bunch of tests done on me. And they determined that I uh, should be medicated every night before I went to sleep. And that would uh, take care of the sleepwalking. So basically from age like five, I was drugged every night before I went to sleep. And I think subconsciously I got the information that if, you, if things aren't going the way you want them to go, take something. So to file that for future reference, moved on through my life. Those tests indicated that uh, I had a very high IQ. I don't have it anymore, so I'm not bragging. Uh, that's long gone. I, uh, uh, <laughs> I, uh, and when I was 12 years old, my father decided it was time for me to become a man, so I got shipped off to boarding school. And I remember being driven to this place and... Uh, um, I didn't even know where we were going, just everybody was in the car and we were driving somewhere and we went to this, uh, went up, drove and drove and drove and drove and drove for hours and ended up at this place and I got out of the car and my father got out of the car and he put a suitcase down next to me and he said, this will make a man out of you and then he got back in the car and everybody left. And uh, the feeling was, was that I'd just been thrown away and I had absolutely no idea why. I mean, it scared the hell out of me. Uh, the fact was I was being given an opportunity for a wonderful education. But uh, I don't deal with the facts. I deal with the feelings. That's just who I was from the gate. So what I felt was that I'd been thrown away. I was terrified of everything and everybody. I was 12 years old. I had no tools for living. Turns out I was the youngest and the smallest kid in a school of uh, 250 young boys. And they had scoured the earth to find 250 of the most disturbed young men they could find. And they put us in this school together. And I fit right in. And uh, I met Tiny the first week I was there. Every school's got a guy named Tiny. He's like 6'4", 240, you know, plays guard on the football team. Actually, Tiny found me, and he walked up to me and said, How you doing, punk? And he slapped me in the back of the head, sent my books flying, and I had this, like, out-of-body experience, you know what I mean, where you're watching yourself do something, but inside your head you're saying, you know, this is a very bad idea. Uh, But you're not listening to yourself. So I walked up to Tiny and hit him as hard as I could. And uh, this had no effect on Tiny whatsoever. And he looked down at me and he said, you know, you got a lot of guts, kid. And then he beat the shit out of me right on the spot. And as I t- was taking this beating, I was thinking, this is going okay. You know? This is all right. I know about beatings. I know how to take a beating. What I don't, what was more important to me was is that I was terrified of this guy. And he had just said, you got a lot of guts. So what I was my first tool for living, violence. Violence masks the fear. If I'm attacking you, it doesn't occur to you how frightened I am. It occurs to you that I'm attacking you. So we go right over the fear thing. And that's what I wanted to do. I just didn't want anybody to know how afraid I was. Um, so word spread around this campus in like 30 minutes, right? And watch out for this little high tower kid. He's a maniac. He attacked Tiny. So now I got this reputation that has absolutely nothing to do with who I am. I'm a frightened little boy, right? Now I got this reputation as this little madman. 
And uh, so the cool guys started coming around, and Matt and Steve swung by. And Matt came up to me and he said, uh, do you want to smoke a joint? And I said, well, yeah, I do. And I, I mean, I had absolutely no idea what he was talking about. I didn't know what that meant. You know, but, but what I heard was is that, uh, do you want to hook up with us? And as far as I could tell, I was alone in the universe. I needed to hook up now. And he, it wouldn't have mattered what he said. He could have said, listen, we're going to go kill the Spanish teacher. Do you want to come? I'd have said, yeah, I'm with you. I needed to, so I hooked up with Matt and Steve, and Steve had a Tupperware container full of cheap red wine, and Steve had this joint, we went behind the dormitory, and, and two 13-year-olds and a 12-year-old standing behind the dorm, staring at each other. And Matt fired up the joint and handed it to me, and I just did what he did, and handed it to Steve, and Matt took a pull on the wine, and the wine came around, I took a pull on the wine, and went around, standing there staring at these two guys, they have no idea why we're here, why we're doing this. And uh, all of a sudden, man, it happened, you know, just... The magic happened. It's just that feeling went down into my shoes and came up over me, and for the first time in my life, I knew everything was going to be all right. I was comfortable standing where I was standing, doing what I was doing with the people I was doing it with, and I had never felt that way in my life. I always knew something was terribly wrong and that I was a big part of that. And I, I, mean, and I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if it's this pot, it's this wine. Maybe it's my two best friends, Matt and Steve, that, I guess, that I've known for 15 minutes. Maybe it's these guys that I just love dearly all of a sudden. And I felt this strong connection to. It didn't matter. I just decided I'm going to do, do this every day no matter what. And I mean, why not? There's no big price to pay for getting high in the beginning. There's no big price to pay. I felt more comfortable than I'd ever felt in my life. The magic was there. I got up the next morning, took a couple of aspirin, went to school, went to class. No price to pay. Uh, unfortunately, that changed dramatically over the next few years. So I did that. I, got, uh, I drank uh, on a daily basis for the next 16 years, and I drank no matter what. In my neck of the woods, I'm from Los Angeles, California, and they got a thing they tell newcomers out there. This is just an opinion of mine. They tell them, uh, just don't drink. Me, personally, I think that misses the point entirely. Uh, to tell, if they'd have told me when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous Earl, just don't drink no matter what, I'd have left. I'd have left. If it was that simple, to just, if I could just not drink no matter what, I guarantee you I wouldn't be here tonight. What the hell for? I'd be home having a weekend, channel surfing, going to movies, doing whatever I felt like doing. I'd be hanging out, living my life. I just wouldn't be drinking no matter what. I'm the flip side of that coin. I drink no matter what. Given a good reason, I don't stop. That's the difference between me and the problem drinker. Problem drinker, you give him a good reason, he can actually stop. Me, I blow right by real good reasons. And I'm not talking about subtle little reasons, you've got to pay close attention or you might miss it kind of reasons. I'm talking about right in your face, big as life, can't miss it reasons, drinking is a bad idea, you shouldn't do it. Problem drinker gets, a, gets another drunk driving charge and goes before the judge and the judge says, uh, you know, I'm sick of seeing you, you know what I mean? I see you one more time, you're going to do a year. We're not going to talk about it. We're not going to discuss it. You're doing a year. Problem drinker says, I want to go to jail, and actually stops drinking and driving. Me, I start wondering what it's going to be like in jail, because I know I'm going. I'm going to jail. I did, he just told me. Next time I see you, you're going to jail. All right, Your Honor, I'll go to jail next time. And on and on, examples, examples, examples. But, I mean, that's the way it was for me. 13 was, 13 was pills. I got into pills, any kind of pills. Um, the only reason I got into pills is the guy walked up and had a couple of pills in his hand. He said, would you like a couple of pills? And I said, well, yeah. Yeah, I would. Took a couple of these pills. And 20 minutes later, I was laying on the floor, and I was very happy down there. I was just <laughs> laid out on the floor. I was very comfortable there. And when he, went, he walked back in, I said, oh, 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 what was that? He said, those are two and all. I said, all right, I've got to remember that. So it was any kind of pills. I mean, I, you know, two and all, second all, Placidil. Placidil. Whew. little identification now right over there. <laughs> yeah. The last time I kicked Placidil, I don't think I said a word for two weeks. They'd just come into my How you doing, Earl? <laughs> that was bad. Fourteen was psychedelics. The only reason I did psychedelics was because uh, I was on a 10-hour pass in boarding school, and I was seeing this girl, Debbie. Debbie was an older woman. She was 15 and a half. And uh, she said, you want, you, you want some acid? And I said, well, yeah. 
and uh, she took out a lipstick tube and popped it open and spun the lipstick up, and there was this little tiny pill on the end of it. So I just took it off and popped it in my mouth and swallowed it. And she said, did you take that whole thing? I said, well, of course I did. It was a very tiny little pill, and I'm used to these horse caps. I mean, I, you know, what she said, three hits of white lightning. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Needless to say, the next two days were real interesting. It was... Uh, <laughs> And at some point in there, we, all I remember was we went to the market, went to the sh- supermarket, and we were, and we decided we were married, and we were going to go to the supermarket and get, get, you know, groceries for the house. We were just blazing away, little children, and we were going down the aisle, and I looked over to her and I said, "Are we married?" She said, "Yes, we are." I said, "Do we have children?" She said, "Yes, we do." And I said, "Then we're going to need these diapers right here." And I about, I blacked out right about there, so I don't know really what went on from there. But about uh, 650 acid trips later, I got classified legally insane by the military. That, but that's a whole other story. 15, I started shooting dope. And the only reason I did that was because uh, this, this woman walked up to me and said, would you like me to stick this in your body? And I said, well, yeah, I would. <laughs> and I did one of these. So she did, and I did this. And as I was going for the table, all I remember thinking was, oh, yeah. <laughs> This will work. I like this. I mean, if somebody come up to me at that point in my life and said, can we get you anything, year old? Do you need anything? I said, no. Do you have any dreams or hopes or aspirations, any goals of any kind? No. There's nothing at all you'd like. I said, well, maybe you could send her back around here again and do that again. That's about, that's about as far as I could see. Now, I'm a child of the 60s. And I've been talking about drugs, and I identify as an alcoholic. And the reason is this. I'm a child of the 60s. What we were focused on was the drugs. Our parents were the drunks. And we were carving out our own identity to break away from our parents. We weren't going to drink ourselves to death like they did. We were going to kill ourselves in a whole new way. We were, we were focused on the drugs. But I'll tell you this, and this is in retrospect, and this is the result of my inventory work. The drugs would come and go, and we were focused on those because we wanted to be hip, we wanted to be the bad boys, we wanted to terrorize our community and do all those lovely, wonderful, socially acceptable things that drug addicts and alcoholics want to do. Um, But there was only one thing that was always on that table, and that was booze. Alcohol was the only thing that was always, every day, no matter what else was going on, booze was on the table. And I, and I think there's a simple explanation for that, and that is, is that booze is extremely reliable, and drugs are not. I mean, you never know what you got till you got it in your body, and then sometimes it's too late. <laughs> it's a little bit too much that day. You never know what you get. I mean, there's no quality assurance going on out there in the drug world. You know what I mean? Nobody's testing this stuff. They're just mixing it up, you know, bagging it up and passing it on to me. I mean, I never went to the cocaine connection and, and said, you know, I'd like a, I'd like a, you know, and I'd like, give me an ounce of that. I said, you know what? It's really not that good today. Why don't you come back on, let's say, Thursday, and we'll have something a little better for you. Never happened. Everybody's always got the best. It's the greatest. You're going to love it. Be careful with this. It's, it'll just knock your socks off, right? That never happened. You never knew what you had until you got it in your body. You go get yourself a fifth of Jack Daniels, you know what you got. You can rely on that. And that's why it was always there. It was the great equalizer. It was the thing that evened everything else up. You do, you do too much acid, things get a little spooky, don't worry about it. Little Jack will ease you back into the comfort zone, you can carry on with the party. Jack will get done what needs to get done. Not enough heroin to get you through the night, don't worry about it. Fifth of Jim will get you where you need to go. That nice, quiet, heart and lungs working place, there's nothing else going on. Your heart's beating, your lungs are working, nothing else happening. The gin will get you there. You do so much cocaine, you can't get your mouth open anymore. Don't worry about it, man. Just suck a little bourbon through your teeth. It'll ease it back off, and you can go back to the party. Booze is reliable. Ugh. So that was me. Uh, 16, I dropped out of high school. My uh, uh, father came back in my life, said, uh, you've obviously gone insane, threw me in my first mental institution. Uh, they signed me up for three, years of ob- uh, three months of observation and a year of rehabilitation. I tried to escape from there. I failed. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I was sitting having lunch with this woman. I always had lunch with this same woman in the nut house. Her name was Kilday. She couldn't possibly still be alive, so I'm just, <laughs> that's what was wrong. And Kilday, and Kilday uh, um, was real easy to wind up, you know what I mean? You just ask her a couple of questions, she'd just spin like a top and just, so she was fun. Every meal was like dinner and a show, you know what I mean? You get your little tray and 
ask Kelly a couple of questions, he'd just snap, you know, and you'd watch Kelly flip out while you had your dinner your lunch. So Kilday was going to be my big diversion, you know what I mean? I was going to sit with Kilday and I was going to flip her out in that direction and I was going to blow out of there through that door. Uh, but I'd been doing the three cups of pills a day and getting a shot every day and I, I'm just shuffling around this place for weeks and I didn't know, you know, that I didn't, I, I, things weren't as I, they appeared to be. So when I flipped Kilday out and sent her that way and everybody ran to get Kilday, I got up out of my chair to haul ass out that door and I was moving like this. You know, and that was it, man. That was as fast as I could go. And I'm like looking down going, what the hell's wrong here, man? I can't. I'm not. And you hear the demoralizing words from the nurse of station. You hear, uh, Ed, when you got a minute, you want to grab her? He's making a break for the door. <laughs> you know, and Ed's over there having a sandwich just going, yeah, yeah, I'll give him in a minute. It's not a problem. <laughs> really bad news when you're trying to break out of the nut house. I learned about, you know, Thorazine Shuffle, man. I learned. You want to bust out of the nut house, you get out before they get the Thorazine in here. You're leaving when they say. So the second time I got thrown in the nut house, I busted out on the first day. Just did that, yeah, yeah, I'm here, I'm glad you got me. It's really rough out on the street. Hey, look at that. <clears throat> you know, hit the door, bells are going off, whistles. I got an intern right on my tail, chasing me across this back lawn. There's a 12-foot chain-link fence over there, and I'm moving for the fence. And at that point in my life, I'm like 16 and a half, 17 years old. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a drug addict. I'm at any moment, I'm a high school dropout. I'm at any moment, hopefully, an escaped mental patient. This is like my resume, you know what I mean? This is all I have to say for myself. But I'm thinking, if I make that fence, I don't have a problem. I don't have any problems if I make that fence. I'll be loaded in 20 minutes, and that's all that matters, because I drink and use no matter what. The, the, and I've, by the time I was 17 years old, man, I had so many good reasons that said, you know what, this isn't working. You're completely alienated from your family. You don't really have any friends. You're, you dropped out of school. They're periodically chasing after you, trying to lock you up. This doesn't add up to a, a, you know, a good start in life. It just doesn't add up. None of that meant anything to me because the only thing that killed the fear inside me was alcohol and drugs. That's what I needed. I needed that stuff in my body just to even up and leave the house and be out in the world, have a conversation with another human being. I didn't get how people did what they did. I went underground early, and I stayed there for a long time. So I hit the streets. I spent three years on the streets doing what you do to stay loaded, just doing whatever it, whatever it takes. By the time I was, uh, I don't know, 19 years old, I, uh, I met this woman at a party, and we talked for 20 minutes, and it went pretty well, so we were in love. <laughs> Rosemary is a nice woman. And I said, uh, and we hooked up, and I said, you know, I don't really know how to do anything. I don't know how we're going to make this thing work. So I went on an interview to a, uh, a very good business college in Northern California, and I got accepted based on the interview. And I didn't even have a high school diploma. Now all of a sudden I got accepted to college, right? So I go to my father and I said, uh, listen, I got accepted to college. Don't ask. You got me a check for the year's tuition, and I'm out of here. And he said, beautiful. Wrote the check. We piled all our belongings and eight pounds of hash in the back of this truck and drove to Northern California to higher learning. And we set up shop, got a little apartment up there by the railroad tracks. And uh, I was going to college during the day. I gave them the year's tuition right up front and said, transcripts are in the mail. They said, no problem. <laughs> I started going to college uh, during the day. I was going to, uh, got my uh, high school uh, equivalency done at night, get those transcripts in, um, and became a drug dealer. You know, I didn't know how to do anything else. I didn't know anything about anything else. And on top of that, I had no morals. I had no ethics. I had no honor. Um, I didn't know anything about any of those things. I wasn't a friend. Um, I wasn't a son. I wasn't a brother. I wasn't any of those things. I was a drug addict, alcoholic, and I started selling drugs. And I was studying marketing and production and distribution while I was going to school. And I was applying these things in my business. And business was booming, and I thought college was great. Uh, the next, second year up there, they diagnosed me to have malignant cancer, and they flew me back to L.A., did major surgery on my back, uh, put me in chemotherapy, told my, my parents I was going to die, told me I was going to die. I remember thinking, you don't even know who you're talking to, man. I mean, the way I'm using it on a daily basis, that comes up like twice a week. You know what I mean? It's, why, this is not a big deal. And so they were doing the chemo thing, and I hated the chemo because, you know, it's a, ba it's a bad high. I didn't like it. So I just stopped doing the chemotherapy, and I went home, and I got loaded the way I get loaded. And uh, I beat the cancer thing. Basically, I think that my body was so toxic at that point in my life 
cancer could not live in my body. <laughs> it was bad. Uh, that was 20. By the time I was 21 years old, I was a junior in college. I had a high school diploma. I was a junior in college. I was drinking and using like a maniac. Um, like a maniac. I moved, Rosemary moved out. We moved her back to L.A. She was saying things like, I'm too high, you know, which is not, you can't say that. You can't, if you can say it, it's not true. If you can say, I'm too high, then you're not. She obviously didn't understand, so she, we moved her back to L.A. Um, I married her later for a day. We got married for one day. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> So, uh, anyway, um, I had a I, junior in college, high school diploma, editor-in-chief of my college newspaper, got accepted to go to USC Law School, early acceptance, go to law school. I mean, I had my ducks lined up pretty good, but I was using like a maniac. I was drinking all day, every day. And I got a call from my mother, and she said, listen, we haven't been anywhere as a family in 10 years. We'll go anywhere you want to go. Let's just go as a family, crying, begging me to be a part of this family. And I said, uh, yeah, all right, fine. So I flew back to L.A., and uh, we took off to fly to Guadalajara on November 7, 1974. And on the way there, the plane crashed. And my mother, my father, and my little sister were all killed. And I wasn't. And I woke up on a mountain in Mexico, and uh, my skull was fractured. My back was broken in three places. My leg was crushed. My arm was crushed. I had a lot of internal injuries. I was paralyzed from the waist down, and I was awake. And uh, I laid there and I watched them all bleed to death right in front of me and there was nothing I could do about it. And uh, I looked up at, the only thing I could move was my right arm and I was banging on the ground with my right arm and I looked up at God and I had a little chat with God and I said, you know what, I'm going to get off this goddamn mountain and I'm going to show everybody in the world how angry I am because I have no interest in a God that would take a loving, kind, gentle girl like my little sister Kimberly and leave a lying, cheating, thieving, useless, dope fiend, alcoholic like me on the planet. There's no justice in it, and I want no part of a God that would do such a thing. Kill my mother and my little sister and leave me. It made no sense. I knew I had no right to be on the planet. I had no right to be alive. But I was angry. A little while later, some guys came up and scavenged the plane crash and uh, got my wallet out, took my money, threw my wallet back on my chest, and then left me up on the mountain to die. They left me there. So I had, no more, I had no interest in you either. So you and God were off the list. I had no interest in any of you. I'd never really been any good at being in the world anyway. I'd never, you know what I mean? I was always self-centered and frightened and fearful and not knowing what to do and having to be a little bit anesthetized or a lot anesthetized every day so that I could just function in the world and be around you and act like I had a clue what was going on when I never did. So I was out of the game. And I just kept banging myself on my side with my arm because it hurt so bad because I was all busted up. But that kept, the pain kept pulling me up out of the shock because I figured if I shocked down, I was going to die. And quite a while later, some other guys came up and they hauled me down. And they took me down to the Mexican Red Cross station and they tagged my right toe and they sat down and lit some cigarettes and waited for me to die, which I wouldn't do. And so they finally took me to the hospital and they, because of some other things we don't need to get into right now, the federales showed up right away. And, uh, and they interrogated me for three and a half days, uh, round the clock, nothing for pain. And uh, finally, when they figured out that what they needed to do was just get me out of the country, they plastered me from the neck down and shipped me back to the States, and I spent a long time in the hospital uh, getting my Demerol, maximum shots of Demerol every three hours around the clock to like, keep me out of So I left the hospital on a cane with a brace, and they had told me I was probably going to have a withered right, left hand, probably wouldn't walk, and be blind in my left eye, and none of those things are true. And I worked real hard to make that happen because I didn't want to show you any weakness. I didn't want you to know anything about me. I didn't want you to see anything about me that you might perceive as a weakness of mine because I was an angry little alcoholic son of a bitch, and I wanted you to see that anger, and I wanted you to feel that anger. And I got out of that hospital, and I went on my last run, and it lasted for four and a half years. Um, I got a lot of money out of the plane crash, and uh, um, I went for it. And I had a house in Bel Air, California, a big Spanish house end up on the hill, and a bunch of cars, and a barrel full of cash, and a basement full of booze, and another room full of drugs. And we threw a party, and man, we went for it. And uh, it got pretty nuts. I mean, you, you, anything we could think up, we did. And uh, blackouts were the normal fare. 
and on and on and on and on and on and on. You know what I mean? I got war stories for days. I mean, it went from there, it went real downhill, real fast, real hard for four and a half years. The only time I drew a sober breath in those four and a half years was I would go into this little sanitarium in Hollywood, California, and they'd strap me to a table, shoot me full of anticonvulsants, and let me ride for 72 hours. 150 cash on the barrel head. And it, this was like, it wasn't a hospital, this was just a little joint somebody set up. And at the end of 72 hours, they'd just send you home or to the morgue, whichever was appropriate. And you, I'd come crawling out of there swearing I'll never drink again as long as I live. I can't take it. My ass is kicked. I cannot do this. And they'd say to me, you be a good boy and don't drink anymore, Owen. And I'd say, yes, ma'am, I will not be drinking anymore. I can't do it. And they'd give me back my wallet and my car keys and my gun and my bottle of Valium. And I'd shake on out of the car and I'd sit down and I'd think, you know, I need to get rid of these shakes. I can't drive real well. So I'd take 40, 50 milligrams of Valium. And then I'd come to in a bar somewhere two, three days later, having no idea how it happened. I'm like, I'm that guy in the book, pounding on the bar. How did this happen? How did this happen again? I did not intend to do this. And it just kept going and going and going. By the time I threw up my hands for the final time, I was uh, 28 years old. I was 215 pounds. I had hair out like this and a beard out like this. I was yellow. I was psychotic. I do not use the term loosely. I had broken 75 bones. I had over 700 stitches in me. I'd been stabbed twice, shot at, fighting, just a crazy person. And I was looking for somebody to kill me, and I never, I mean, we're pretty durable, you know. So they were missing the mark by inches on several occasions. And uh, both my hands were broken, and I'd been in the last of hundreds of blackouts. And uh, I had a moment of clarity. My moment of clarity was I don't want to die. When it came right down to it, where there's nothing left to do but die, I didn't want to die. And I raised up my two busted paws, and I said, help. And they took me to an emergency room, and they pumped my stomach, and they said, get him out of here. He's going to die. This guy's pathetic. And they took me to ambulance to another place. They kept me five days. I got worse. They said, get him out of here. He's going to die. And they took me by ambulance to another place. And they kept me for 12 more days of detox and then 30 days of rehab on a free bed. And I came out of there as crazy as I've ever been in my life. And I came out of there with one piece of information. And that was, if you drink again, you're dead. And I ended up in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I did not come here because I wanted what you had. I had no idea what you had. I just knew I couldn't live with what I had anymore. It was over for me. I mean, when I got here, my family was dead. I had no friends. I had no place to live. I had no money. I had a box of clothes. I had broken everything in my body. My spirit was crushed. I did not have a relationship with another human being on the face of the earth, and I had no relationship with God. I was completely and utterly alone in the universe. I knew it. I felt it. And I didn't know how to be any other way. I had no tools for living that worked. And that, for me, was the only way I was going to get here. I wasn't going to get here with one thing working in my life. Not one thing. And all I knew was is that if you drink, you die. And Alcoholics Anonymous is where people go when they don't want to drink and they don't want to die. So I came. And I sat in the back with my arms folded with my best tough guy look on my face. So if you're sitting in the back with your arms folded with your best tough guy look on your face and you're a badass, God bless you. Welcome. You're in the right place. We didn't all look like this when we got here either, you know? And I sat in the back and, I mean, I was glaring. I was crazy, mad, angry. And all, you know, all the guys with time saw those subtle little signals I was sending out, you know what I mean, which was get near me and I'll try to kill you. They just said, they didn't come near me. They just said, brother, the coffee's right over there. Grab yourself a cup of coffee in your seat and we'll be, you know, welcome. They did that from about 20 feet away. <laughs> but every meeting's got the new guy, you know, six, eight, nine months of sobriety. He just caught fire with Alcoholics Anonymous, and he's going to give it away tonight. And that meeting had one, and his name was Vegas N. And Vegas saw me, and all he saw was a new guy. And he came flying across the room with his hand out and a big smile on his face, and I sat there thinking, oh, shit. Look at this, will you? What am I going to do with this guy? You know, look, he's smiling. I hate that. I don't know. I don't have anything to say, and he's going to find that out, so i got to back this guy off. He came up to me and said, Hi, I'm Vegas. I'm an alcoholic. And I said, So what? Me too, man. And it ain't exactly the highlight of my life. I don't know what you're so goddamn happy about. Get away from me. And he looked at me, and he did that newcomer thing. You know what I mean? He did, Oh, man, they do this in my neck of the woods. I don't know about you people, but he gave me that real knowing look. You know, and a couple guys kind of stop right there and kind of look, Oh, he's going to do it to him. And I looked up like, what? And he looked at me and he said, keep coming back. <laughs> oh, man, I was thrilled to hear that. 
I said, great, thank you. Let me see if I, let me let's review this here a minute, Vegas, all right? You've given me this big look like you're about to lay this thing with gr deep spiritual significance upon me, and, and, and it's keep coming back. I don't get it. I do not see the deep spiritual significance of this, but clearly you and these bozos behind you think this is a pretty heavy statement. So am I wrong in saying this? You all know what it means. I don't. I'm the loser. You win. I feel much better now. Thank you very much, Alcoholics Anonymous. That's a tremendous import to me. I won't even think of drinking tonight. I'll just think, well, I'll keep coming back, whatever the hell that means. I hated that. I hated it. And then that means they said, you know, one day at a time, keep coming back. They said all that kind of stuff over my head. Man, I had no idea what these people were talking about, why this was such a big deal. And I'll tell you what, if you're new, I got a suggestion for you. The next time somebody walks up to you and says, hey, keep coming back, or one day at a time, partner, or my personal favorite, hey, just turn it over, all right? <laughs> they do that to you, step up to the plate and say, excuse me, but I don't understand the deep spiritual significance of that. Would you mind expanding on that for me a little bit? Well, if they tell you, if there's my neck of the woods, if they tell the truth, about 80% of them would have to say, you know what, I don't really know what the hell that means either, you know. <laughs> they said it to me when I got here, and I've been saying it to people since I've been here, you know. I said, I don't know, but you know, there's a guy over there that reads the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. Why don't we go ask him? Maybe he'll know. So just step up to the plate. Anyway, just an opinion. Another alcoholic with an opinion. <laughs> That's shocking, huh? Uh... So I ended up in the back of the rooms, and this old-timer got up. He was 65 years old. He was a skid row bum. He was an ex-boxer, and he was a wino. I immediately noticed those are things I am not, because I am excellent at spotting the differences between you and me immediately. I don't look for the similarities. Never did. I do now, but I didn't then. And he got up and he said those things, and I thought, you know what, I'm none of those things. Man, this guy's got nothing for me. I was very good at that. I mean, if you, I, I, but before I got here, man, I mean, if you're a woman, you don't know about me. You black, gay, Hispanic, you come up in something else. You don't, you don't know about me. You're five years older, five years younger. You don't know about me. You come up in another time, in another thing. I spot the difference between you and me immediately. I got so good at circling those wagons as tight as I could. By the time I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, it was, if you're not Earl, you don't understand me. I just knew nobody understood me. That terminal uniqueness that is not unique with me. Luckily, Alcoholics Anonymous has robbed me of all of that. If you're in this room, you know all about me. You know all about me. You know, you, need, you know everything you need to know about a guy like me. So anyway, the beauty of that moment was is that if I had anywhere in the world to go, I'd have gone right then. But I didn't have any place else to go. There was nowhere to go. What was I going to do? I mean, when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, if they'd have said, you know what, you should go to a meeting a day, and our meetings are from noon to midnight. We have 12-hour meetings every day. There would have been no conflict in my schedule. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I didn't have a job, I didn't have family, I didn't have friends, I didn't even have a place to live. I mean, I was, I was homeless and didn't know it. And he got up and he changed my life. He got up and he shared two things that blew my mind. He talked openly and honestly about his feelings as a man, and I had never heard anybody do that before. And I, was, I got to sit back there with my arms folded, looking like I hated this whole thing, resenting the whole deal. But inside I just kind of went, wow. And then it was like he looked right at me and he said... Uh, and I don't care whether you like what I got to say or not. You don't like what I got to say? Go to another meeting. I love that. I love that, man. Because it made it clear to me, this guy's not selling me something. He's sharing it with me. He's not selling it to me. He's sharing it with me. If I want it, I can have it. If there's something there I can use, take it. If not, go to another meeting, and eventually you're going to hear somebody else say something that you can use in your life. And that blew my mind, and I thought, you know what, this is cool, I'm coming back. And something happened right there that changed my life. And what it was, was I am a low-bottom, hope-to-die, dope-fiend alcoholic. And I came here a broken, soulless, hopeless individual. And that guy shared that night, and a little light of hope went on inside me. And I had hope for the first time that I could ever remember. And I thought, I'm going to go back. Maybe there's a way a guy like me doesn't have to go back and dance with a beast anymore. Maybe I don't have to go back into madness. Maybe I can stay here. And I came back, and I kept coming back. And I've been coming back every, every single day since November 6, 1980. And, I've been, and that's, um, what's amazing about that to me is, is that I cannot stay sober. I cannot stay sober. But we can. We can. So I hung with you like my life depends upon it because it does. And little things started happening. They said, get a sponsor. I said, what's a sponsor? 
You know, I never was nice or polite about anything. I never talked in Alcoholics Anonymous. I sat in the back all the time, and I never took a chip. I, never, I didn't take a cake until I was three years sober. I didn't open my mouth in Alcoholics Anonymous until I was two and a half. The only thing I did was I got a sponsor and I did everything he told me to do. And I told him everything he told me to do was a bad idea, a lousy idea, and I didn't understand why he was making me do these things. I got a vicious sponsor. I got an absolutely remarkable sponsor. One of the greatest examples of Alcoholics Anonymous I ever met in my life. That man saved my life because he was Alcoholics Anonymous to me. He was the only human being on the face of the earth I trusted for the first two and a half years that I was here. I didn't trust anybody. I didn't talk to anybody. I talked to him and I did what he said. And he just rebuilt me from the ground up. He taught me how to do the simplest things. He taught me. He went so far beyond what you would expect of a sponsor. It was unbelievable. His name was Donald M. And he was my sponsor up until right before, uh, until July 25th of last year, which was the day he died. And that was the hardest thing I ever experienced in my life. That beat the pl- I was with him longer than I was with my family. I was with him for almost 14 years. I left home when I was 12. And uh, he told me what to do. And I did it. And I went to seven to nine meetings a week. And eventually I took out two panels a month. And I had three or four commitments every week. And I never turned down an AA request. And when I was two and a half and said I'd never speak in Alcoholics Anonymous, he said, that's a lovely sentiment. And you're the first speaker here next Saturday night. He was just waiting for me to draw a line in the sand. And every time I did, he knew it was time for me to step over it because you've got to be willing to go to any length you want to stay here. They tell you that the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. However, if you would like to stay, there are a few suggestions that are made in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. They're just suggestions. Nobody think of telling you what to do. You probably only react to it the way I would, <laughs> which is with all the defiance I could muster. And he, he showed me how to, how to be in the world. He showed me what to do between meetings. He showed me about getting up. He showed me about being responsible. He taught me what a friend was by being one to me. And he just kept me going. He kept telling me, you're doing beautiful, man. You're doing beautiful. Keep going. Keep going. I got five years of sobriety. And I came up to him and I said, Donald, I got five years. And you know what? It's been a pretty easy five years, hasn't it? And he just burst out laughing. He said, Earl, you have had the most hellacious time hanging on to this program. It's been horrible. He said, but I guess in comparison to what you went through to get here, it wasn't that bad of a deal. He said, but I've got to tell you, Earl, if you'd have known how destroyed you were when you got here, you wouldn't have bothered to come. And we know that about you. You just would have given it up. And I thought, you know, yeah, I guess he was right, you know, because I didn't know about being comfortable standing where you were standing and doing what you were doing with the people you were doing it with unless you were wrecked. I didn't know about having friends. I didn't know about going back to the same place and having people say, nice to see you. Just the little stuff that other people took for granted that live out there in the world, I I didn't take for granted. I was amazed by those things. I was amazed being able to sit in a meeting and just feel comfortable. Just be comfortable sitting in a meeting, not thinking about this or worrying about that. I mean, I have to remember what it's like to be new. I have to remember what it's like to be new because I sponsor a lot of guys. And I get the new ones, you know, and I'll take Ed and I'll say, Ed, let's go to a meeting. I'll find out that there's this guy, Al F., is talking. Al F. is an amazing human being. He's got 31 years of sobriety, and the pearls of wisdom that flow out of this guy's mouth are absolutely remarkable. And I think, i got to take Ed. Ed's got 90 days. I'm going to take Ed. Ed's going to hear Al. What an amazing opportunity for a guy with just 90 days to go hear the, ma- the magic that comes out of this man's mouth. So I go get Ed, and we go run over, we sit down in the front row, and Al's going to talk, and I'm thinking, this is beautiful, man, and Al gets up, and Al's ripping one, man, I mean, it is a pitch, and this, the pearls of wisdom are coming out, and I'm sitting there thinking, man, this is incredible, this is incredible, that at 90 days, he's being exposed to this amazing talk. What I have to remember is, is that Ed is not going to the same meeting I'm going to. <laughs> Ed is having an entirely different meeting. He is, it's taken me all of the 14 plus years that I've got to hear what I'm hearing from Al. Ed's got 90 days. He's looking at it from a different angle. He is hearing a completely different pitch. And I have to remember that. It doesn't mean that his meeting is any less valuable than mine. It doesn't mean that he's not getting what he needs. I remember me walking into a meeting at Ohio Street, a famous club over in West L.A. where they have a lot of meetings. And I remember me going to my first meetings at Ohio Street, walking up to the building, and what went on in my head as these great speakers were up there doing their thing. I'm walking up to the, the meeting hall, and it's just, 
okay, I found the building, I found the building. This is good, this is good, this is good. We're going to be all right, we're going to be all right. Okay, just breathe. Okay, just breathe, breathe. We're going in, we're going in, we're in, we're in. Okay, now you got to find a seat. you got to put your keys on a seat. Where are you going to sit? Where the hell am I going to sit? I don't know where to sit. This is crazy, man. Just find a seat. There's a guy with a red coat. Sit next to the guy with a red coat. Just spot the guy with a red coat and you sit next to him and everything will be cool. It's fine. It's fine. Go. Put the keys down. Go outside. Okay, everybody's outside. We'll stand outside. They're ringing a bell. They're ringing a bell. Why? We're all going in. We're going, oh, they're going to start the meeting. All right, all right. Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. There's a guy, he's up, he's reading, he's reading, he's reading. What's he reading? What is he reading? He's reading chapter, chapter something, chapter something. He's rarely, he's rarely seen something. I don't know. He rarely saw, I don't know. I'm having a little trouble keeping track of this. There's 12 things. He's reading 12 things. There's 12 things I should remember. Remember 12 things. Remember 12 things. That's good. That's good. All right, now we're going to go on. We're going to go. Oh, he's down. He's down. I missed that whole thing. I had no idea. It says that chap, rarely saw something and there were 12 things involved. Okay, I'll hang on to that. That'll be good. That'll be good. Here comes another guy. He's up. He's talking. He's talking. He drank. He drank. I drank. This is good. I drank. I drank. Yeah, I like that. I like that. He's down. I don't really, I miss a lot of that. He's down, though, and that's good. Here's another guy. He said, they're passing a basket. There's, pa there's money in the basket. There's money. Don't take the money. Don't take that money. Don't take the money. Here comes the basket. Don't put your hand. Just pass it by. Pass it by. There it goes. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you. I didn't take any money. I didn't take any money. He's hitting the gavel. He's banging the gavel. We're all, everybody's standing up. Where are we going? We're going outside. We're going to smoke. I smoke. I smoke. That's good. We'll go outside. We'll smoke. I'm smoking. I'm smoking. There's a, the, the bell again. There's a bell. There's a bell. Okay. We're going to go in. We're in. We're in. We're sitting down. He's sitting there. There's another guy. He's up with the 12 things. Yeah, I don't think these are the same 12 things. They're reading another 12 things. 12 things are for the AA hey, has 24 things. All right. Remember that. AA hey, has 24 things. He's down. He's down. I don't remember any of that either. Right. Here comes another guy. He's up. He's talking. He drank. I did that. I did that. I did that. This is good. I did that. I like this. I like this. He's down. Something else happened. Here's another guy. He's up. He's up. I don't know what he's talking about. Everybody's standing up again. What are we doing? They got my hands. They got my hands. What are we doing? We're doing this prayer. It's a prayer. It's the Lord's prayer. I know this prayer. I said this prayer. I said this prayer. I mean, good. And I walk out of the meeting and I think, <sighs> I've been to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. That was me when I was new. That was the inside of my head. And you know what? That was an outstanding meeting. That was an excellent meeting. I got a lot out of that meeting. Because I went there, I sat down, I didn't hurt anyone, I didn't use any of my tools for living. I didn't drink, use, attack anybody, or run. I didn't do any of it. I sat on my hands and I made it through an entire meeting, and I left. And people come up to me and say, how's the meeting, Earl? And I'd give them the newcomer mantra. Fine. Fine. Get a lot of that? Yeah, fine. I did. Now I'm sitting there, now, I'm, now I don't know better. I went through years of that kind of stuff. And I'm sitting here with Ed, listening to Al, thinking how incredible this is. And we walk out of the meeting and I say, Ed, isn't that an amazing meeting? Would you believe the things that that man understands about being alive on this planet? And you look at me and you go, yeah, it's great. It's fine. Sure. <laughs> Ed, it's, just, it's just Ed's turn. And I've got to remember that and let Ed have his turn just spinning in a meeting. Because we all sit there and we look fine. You know, and we do that. Fine. I'm fine. I'm all right. I'm fine. You know, and we're just thinking the most insane stuff while that's going on. And that's just being new. And i got to remember what that's like for that guy. But what I also need to remember is that six and a half years of sobriety, I was going nuts. Uh, yeah. Short trip, right, lady? <laughs> I was going nuts. I had no idea what was going on. I was so uncomfortable in my body, and I was doing everything. Seven to nine meetings a week, calling my sponsor every day, speaking when I was asked to speak. I mean, I was actually opening my mouth in Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, and every, and I had an apartment. I had a car. I had a better car. I had a better apartment. I had some clothes. I was doing the AA dating thing. I'm in love. Maybe not. I'm in love. Maybe not. I'm in love. Maybe not. <laughs> Just a boy running around trying to act like a man. God Almighty. Just trying to find a place for me, someplace I belong, right? And I couldn't find it. I was going nuts. Oh, so I wonder if this old timer, if you're new, be very, very careful around people with time. They will mess you up. They will. They will mess you up. Man, I walked up to this guy and I said, hey, Seven nine meetings a week, talk to my sponsor every day, sponsor a lot of guys, taking out panels, got commitments, blah, 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 blah. How come I'm so nuts? He said, Earl, so how you come in, young man? If you don't get yourself a program, you're probably going to die. Go away. <laughs> said, excuse me. Ran down my whole thing to him again. I said, what are you talking about a program? I got an excellent program. He said, Earl, what you're describing is the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. Vital to your recovery. Glad you're doing it. 
The program, however, is found in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I suggest you get the book and read it, or you're probably going to die. Go away. I said, all right, you old son of a bitch. Fine, I've got to get a book. I'm going to work the steps at that guy right over there. I hate that guy. So me and this buddy of mine, he had eight, and a half, eight years, I had six and a half years. I said, okay, we're new. What's the deal? Got the big book. It's a blue thing, about that big. It was, a, it was news to me. I had this friend of mine that was hysterical call me up one day and he said, uh, she said, uh, we're step three in the book. I said, I'm not going to rob you of the pleasure of discovering that for yourself in the book. It's in the book. Read it. And I knew where it was at that point. I said, but no, you know, part of the fun of it was finding it for myself. You go in there and find it. She goes, come on, just tell me where it is. I said, no, go in and find it for yourself. It'll mean more to you if you do it that way. Get used to going to the book to find what you need. And she said, I know. It's in that chapter, We Antagonists, isn't it? I said, yeah, that's the one. Go right in there and find that chapter. <laughs> and that's what I was like. So we sat down and we got this book. And I said, you know, this is remarkable. There was this, on the cover of the book, there was this circle with a triangle in it, ancient spiritual symbol. It stood for mind, body, and spirit, brought together as a whole human being. And therein lies the balance that I have always sought in my life and never had. Alcoholics Anonymous adopted the symbol of unity, recovery, and service. The unity is the body. I bring it here. I must be with my fellows. I must come to these meanings. And it's an interesting circle about coming to these meetings. When I'm new, I come to these meetings because I have nothing to offer anyone. I have nothing to give anyone. My life is completely bankrupt and of no value in any area. And I come here and I take. And what I take is I take what the fellowship offers me and I do the commitments. And I do the thing. And it's not because I'm the, the new guy that I do the commitments. It's because I'm the new guy and they give me the best stuff the program, the fellowship has to offer. They give me the coffee commitment, which is an opportunity for me to get out of myself and be of service to you, something I never knew anything about before I came to AA. I had never thought about anybody but me. Never. But doing the making the coffee, I got to get out of myself and be there for you for your coffee, make sure everything's done right. And on a big meeting on a Friday night, for me, it was about a four-hour commitment. And while the coffee's getting made, it helped me set up. And I'd get out of self, out of self, out of self. The whole damn point of being a service. And when I came back to me, I'd come back with a new perspective and a new understanding and a little bit healthier view of what it's like to be in the world. And I got to learn those things being in the fellowship. The unity was the body. I bring it here. I sit down and I shut up and I listen like the old timers told me to do because what I need is here, not in here at that point. But once I've done that, and then the second side of the triangle, which is the recovery of the mind, the recovery is of the mind, the greater aspect of my disease. I mean, if it was just about the body, if it was just about not drinking no matter what, I could set the bottle down and I'd be free, right? I mean, if that were true, detox centers would be kicking out winners, man. They'd be 72 hours and free. Thanks for stopping by for the weekend, Earl. You go have yourself a good life. I say, thank you very much, and I go have a good life. But I got this obsession in the mind that tells me, that says in the book, the persistence of this illusion, this belief in a lie that I can drink like a normal individual is astonishing. That many of us pursue it to the gates of insanity and death. Been to those gates. My head tells me I can have a drink. It tells me it's okay, I'm just going to have a couple. And it doesn't do like I thought it would do when I was new. It doesn't just walk around sweeping up at Ohio Street and all of a sudden the head just goes, drink! You know, and you just run out and you go to the liquor store and you got a bottle and you're in the back waiting for that gin to hit and do what it does and wondering where this is going to take me this time. It's not like that. I'm walking around sweeping up Ohio Street and my head says, how you doing, Earl? Come to bed, Jay, aren't we, buddy? It's a terrible day. It's an awful day. I don't know what it is. People have been treating you poorly all day long. And I don't know why they do that, Earl, because you're a wonderful human being. You're a great guy. I love you. I love you, you know I love you, I've always been here for you and I always will, you know that. He said, you know what, Earl, you're very stressed, you're very tense, and tension is a bad thing. It's a bad thing. It's unhealthy, Earl. Being tense is unhealthy. And what we're going to do here is we're going to just have us a couple of little drinks and we're going to unwind that internal spring we're going to walk, we're going to walk all the way through this. I'm here for you, Earl, I love you, and I would not let you down and I would not steer you wrong, isn't that right? And you, know, and you don't have to tell anybody, Earl, let's just be our little secret, everything will be all right. Now, I've just finished a meeting of Alcoholics and I'm, I'm swooping up and I'm going, well, yeah. That's right. Persistence of this illusion is astonishing. If I pick this up and take a drink, I activate the phenomenon of craving, which is a physical phenomenon. I activate that and I'm off and running and I'm, I don't have the power to choose anymore. I'm a slave to it one more time. There's no telling where it's going to stop. And my best thinking won't have anything to do with it. I will not be able to decide a thing. And I understand that. So the recovery of the mind, is, if I'm sitting in this room, it's not about stopping. I've done that. It's about not starting again. How do I not start again? And I address the obsession of the mind. How do I do that? I work the 12 steps. What are the 12 steps? Step one is what's the problem? Well, lack of power is my dilemma. That's my own devices I drink. And 
it's an absolutely amazing experience. I got 16 years to tell me that. So if, that's, if lack of power is your problem, what's your solution? Step two, a power greater than me is going to have to restore me to sanity, soundness of mind, relieve me of this obsessive thinking. Biggest promise in the book as far as I'm concerned. Well, knowing that, you'll get drunk. What should you do? Well, you better make a decision to do something about it, Earl. Luckily, that's step three. Got down on my knees, said the third step prayer, made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God. Well, that's what I turn over. Turn that over, my life, to the care of God. Can't kill myself anymore. It's not my life to take. It says in the book, it tells me once you've done that, you better embark upon a rigorous, honest plan of action. It's going to bring about that solution in your life. Because so far, you've just accepted your problem, accepted the solution, made a decision to do something about it. Now you've got to do something about it so it will happen in your life. It's the only book I know of that's designed to bring about an experience. So I did this, this uh, action plan, four through nine. Did a four-column inventory on resentment, fear, and sex. Fifth step, a guy came in the house. I read it before God to that individual. He left. Six and seven, I hooked it back up with God. Eight and nine, I hooked it back up with you. And 10, 11, and 12, keep me in the game. 10 is me, 11 is God, and 12 is you. There ain't nobody else to play with. Those are the, th the 11 and 12 are the things that I've pushed out of my life forever. I swore I would never love another human being again as long as I lived. And there was no way I would ever tell any of you who I am. There's no way you're going to love me. It was not going to happen. It wasn't in the game for me. And, all, and, and slowly but surely in the process of Alcoholics Anonymous, all that has become untrue. All of it. So 10, I keep my side of the street clean. And when I'm wrong, I promptly admit it. That's me. I, I don't worry about what you're doing. I worry about what I'm doing. I stick to my side of the street and I try to stay off of yours. Eleven, I seek God. It's an action step. That's my relationship with God. And I seek God. How? Through prayer and meditation. What do I pray for? Knowledge of His will for me and the power to carry that out. That's it. Why do I meditate? So to quiet the mind so that when the answers come, I can hear them. And the twelfth step is the third side of the triangle. Having had a spiritual awakening is the result of the steps. That was the whole point I did it was to be restored to sanity, soundness of mind, have that obsessive thinking removed, I could practice these, I could be of service. I could practice these principles and carry the message. You. So now all of a sudden, I've worked these steps. The only reason I'm doing them is because I don't want to go back into madness. I don't want to drink. I don't want to dance with the beast anymore. That's why I did it. And now all of a sudden, when I'm dealing with you, I realize that I have to deal with you from a standpoint of how can I help as opposed to what do you got for me. I mean, my entire life, if you had alcohol, drugs, sex, money, or information on how I could get some of the above, I would talk to you. If you didn't, next. And now I'm supposed to come at you with how can I help. And I don't do that because I'm a good guy. I do that because I don't want to drink. Because I don't want to drink. That's why I do it. I mean, it's amazing in here. I mean, this thing goes so far past not drinking and using. It's unbelievable. They say there's a design for living here and it really, really happens. Things happen that I didn't plan on, I didn't ask for, I wasn't looking for, I knew I could not have in my life. And I do today. And I do because I keep a clearer purpose in here. People, I say Alcoholics Anonymous for me is about not drinking. It's about staying sober. That's what it's about. Now, people tell me Alcoholics Anonymous is about love, Alcoholics Anonymous is about forgiveness, Alcoholics Anonymous is about acceptance. I disagree. I think Alcoholics Anonymous is about staying sober. If a guy like me is going to stay sober, there's certain actions I must take. It tells me on page 30, the first, the, the first step in recovery, I must accept to my innermost self that I am alcoholic. That is the first step in recovery. Page 25, it tells me there is a solution to the problem. And I'm not going to like the three things it lists that are required for a successful consummation of this deal. And I'm paraphrasing. But I'm close. <laughs> That's what it says. I've got to do these things if I want the big buzz. Now, I don't know about you, but I was a pig out there, and nothing's changed. I want the whole buzz in here. I want the whole buzz. I'm not, I'm not, did you ever say out there, no, thank you, I've had enough? Did you ever say that? Why the hell would I want to say something like that in here? I want the whole deal. I want to find out what's available in this deal. So I want to do all of it. And if I do all of it, in order to stay sober, I'm going to run into all kinds of love, forgiveness, acceptance, compassion. I'm going to learn things that I knew nothing about living out there like the animal that I was. I learned how to be a man. I don't think Alcoholics Anonymous for the best life I've ever had. I think I'm for the only one I've ever had that's been of any value whatsoever. It's just the way it is for me. I mean, it's hard to express, you know. I was a dead man just walking around. 
I didn't know how to be in the world at all. And I'm doing okay in the world now. I'm pretty, co I'm comfortable being Earl. I'm comfortable standing where I'm standing and doing what I'm doing with the people I'm doing it with. I do things that I know I can't do. I mean, an example of how much Alcoholics Anonymous means to me is that I'm here. Because to get here, I gotta get on an airplane. I don't get on an airplane for anything. They scare me to death. I get that airplane starts taking off down that runway and starts to lift off and that G-force hits my body and pictures start popping into my head because my brain tells me this is dangerous, you die here, you don't want to do this, remember this, remember this, remember this, remember this, and some really nasty, ugly stuff goes flying through my head and the terror hits and I'm afraid all the way there. And there's only one thing that will get me in a plane and it's Alcoholics Anonymous because Alcoholics Anonymous told me you've got to be willing to go to any length. So now what I, happens to me when I get in an airplane and it isn't, oh my God, I'm going to die, now I've gotten to the point where, as much as I'm still filled with that same care, it's like one more time I get to demonstrate for myself that I'm willing to go to any length. One more time I get to demonstrate for myself that I'm earning my seat, that I have a right to be here. Because remember, I'm the guy that knew he didn't have a right to be alive. I didn't have a right to be breathing in and out. I went through all that survivor's guilt and all that post-traumatic stress disorder and all that stuff. I mean, I was six years sober and I was having to pull a car over. I was shaking so bad because it was all coming up. And Alcoholics Anonymous showed me how to deal with that stuff and keep giving my life back to God and keep moving and doing the things that I needed to do. Today, I mean, I have an absolutely remarkable life. I run my own business. I live in a nice place. I do the things that I want to do. I'm having a good life. I got lo I'm loving and being loved. I got friends. I have a sense of family. And all that's available to me. And I'm able to take life on life's terms, the good and the bad. In 1994, um, my wife had a miscarriage, separated and filed for divorce. A guy that I sponsored for six and a half years, who was like a little brother to me, was murdered. Had to be a pallbearer at his funeral. My, um, my goddaughter's mother was murdered, and they cut my little goddaughter's throat. And she lived. Um, she's 13 years old now, an absolutely remarkable little girl. Um, and she knows I love her, and she trusts me completely, and she knows I understand where, she, where she's at. And we have a beautiful relationship. Um, my sponsor died. Donald died. It was the hardest thing I'd ever been through in my life. I mean, I, he was alcoholic, Donald. It's, I mean, it broke my heart when he died. And I felt like God broke my heart when Donald died. And you know what? It never occurred to me to drink. It never occurred to me to use. Um, what I did was I recommitted to Alcoholics Anonymous. I was waiting for him to come get Donald's body, and I had another sponsor. And I, because I had said in my head, I'm not, I'll never be sponsored by another person. I'll never betray that relationship. And I heard Donald in my head. And Donald said, you'll have another sponsor right now, you little son of a bitch, or you'll drink. And I picked up the phone, I called somebody that I knew Donald loved and respected. And, I, and that I knew respected Donald, and I called him up and said, Donald's dead, will you sponsor me? And he said, yeah. He's been very gentle and patient with me since then while we've been going through what we've been going through. And I've realized at this point in my life, at 13 months later after Donald being gone, I can tell you Donald Madden is alive and well. Because half of the stuff that I said tonight, I learned from Donald. And the guys that I sponsor learn about Donald. Because I sit with my boys and I tell them about Donald. Because we got a path and we got a way here in this big tribe. And it's in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. But our history we pass on to each other verbally. We get to gather around the campfire like this and we share our history and our experience and our strength and our hope and we tell each other about where we got it and those that have gone before us and what they gave us and that we pass that on to the best of our ability the way that it was handed down to us so that we remain clear of purpose so that what Alcoholics Anonymous is about doesn't change. So I tell people, and I'm the son of Donald M, who was the son of Norm A, who was the son of Chuck C, who was the son of Bill W, and that's my train, and those are my elders, and those are the people that I try to honor and respect. And I tell all my boys about them, and they go out and they say, yeah, my sponsors are late, and he was sponsored by Don Lim, and these are the things that he told us about them. And it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on. And we're this big, giant tribe, and we stick to the singleness of purpose of this deal, and a guy from Los Angeles, California, gets to come to a place called Holman, Louisiana, and walk into a room full of people he's never seen before in his life and feel welcome. People hugging on me and making sure I got what I need and taking care of me and treating me like a member of the tribe, treating me like a member of their family. And that's what Alcoholics Anonymous has done for me in my life. It's given me that. That's bigger than anything I ever thought was possible being on this planet. Man, if you are new, check this deal out. There's people in here with lights on in their eyes that you just can't believe. And I'll tell you what, they didn't look like this when they got here. You're thinking, oh man, what am I going to do? I can't drink, I can't use anymore. I'm not going to have any more fun. Look at all these lightweights sitting around the pool listening to this maniac. It ain't, that ain't the way it is. Everybody in the world has got people, they run up to the cliff and they say, ooh, the cliff, and they take a step back. 
What this room is filled with is the people who ran up on that cliff, never slowed down, and dove off the cliff into the abyss. That's what this room is filled with. We either go, we go to jail, we go to prison, we go to mental institutions, we go to the morgue, and we come here. Now, if you'd prefer one of those other places, be my guest. Far be it for me to stop anybody. With my history, I'm in no position to judge anybody about anything. But I suggest that possibly you come in here and check this thing out. And I don't mean hang back and go to a meeting and go, yeah, bullshit, and leave. I mean, check it out. Challenge us. Be, if you're crazy, perfect. Have a seat. If you're so angry, you don't know whether you're going to kill somebody else or yourself at any moment, I understand you. Have a seat. You're very welcome here with all those feelings going on inside you. And you know what? If you slip in and out of this program over and over and over and over again and you come in here and anybody gives you any shit at all, you tell them Earl said, fuck you. I apologize about the F word. Here's a dollar for the thing. I have to give a dollar every time I do that now. I apologize. I got a little carried away. I'm sorry for that word. But the whole point is, is that what the only thing in here is, is that this is Alcoholics Anonymous, and the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. And if you have that, you come in and you take a seat. My job as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous is to extend my hand, say, welcome. Is there anything I can do for you? Here's a cup of coffee. If you'd like to talk after the meeting, I'd be honored to do that with you. That's it. The rest of it's God's business. It's not mine or the judgmental opinion of another member of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's not what it's about. So if you're in here fighting for your life, sit down and take your seat. That's it. There ain't nothing else going on. And we have to stay that way. I have to stay that way. And I know why people judge people who come back in. is because when you see somebody go out and then come back in, it scares me. Because that could happen to me. And if you scare me, I'm going to back you off. Right? But I've got to get past my fear, my self-centered fear, and I have to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and move in that direction. So that's what I try to do. And if, if you're new, try to look at it that way. You're just getting your turn, and we will afford you every right to take your turn at being new and go through what you've got to go through at the time you've got to go through it and the way you've got to go through it. All you've got to do is try and work the three sides of that triangle. The unity is the body. Bring it here. The recovery is of the mind. Get in that book and work those steps and find somebody that can show you the way to do that. And once you've done that, you don't come to meetings anymore to take. You come to meetings to give. Because the reason we have meetings is so that the newcomer has a place to come to get what we now have as a result of having gone through the book, having done the work, having had the spiritual awakening. So I don't come anymore to take. I come to give. Not because I'm a good guy, because I want to stay sober. Because it's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me in my life. I'm doing the stuff I, c I couldn't do. All the things that were gone in my life, I have been given back by Alcoholics Anonymous and ten times more than that. It's a beautiful, beautiful trip. Check it out. It's the biggest buzz on earth for people like us. You're going to get higher here than you have ever been in your life. The difference here is, is that when you're out there using, you get the buzz first and you pay later. And you pay dearly. Here we got lucky. You're going to pay up front. But the longer you stay here, the bigger the buzz is going to get. And what that suggests is tomorrow there's more love for you. Tomorrow there's more dignity for you as a human being. Tomorrow there's more self-respect. Tomorrow there's more loving and being loved. See, I got screwed up in the beginning, man. I thought if I came in these rooms and I was respectful towards you, you would be respectful towards me. It's not true. What happens is, is that if I'm respectful towards you, I become a respectable human being. I thought if I loved you, you would love me. It's not true. What happens if I love you is, is that I get to be a loving man. I had it all wrong. The magic in here is remarkable. But you know what? It's not magic that you get by sitting around talking about it. It's magic you get by doing it. It's in the footwork. So buckle your seatbelt and jump into this game with the rest of us, man. We'll love you till you can't love yourself. And then when you can, we're probably going to hand you a newcomer and say, get to it. Thanks a lot, Louisiana. I've had a real nice time.